Okay, welcome to chapter 17, the vertebrates, which is known as phylum chordata. Um, this, is this lecture will coincide with chapter 17a, and I try to follow it pretty closely in line with the pages. So if you want to go back and read that chapter for further understanding, that would be great. Otherwise, just go with the fill-in-the-blank notes um, that I gave you in class. Okay, these are all the different characteristics or the different categories that we're going to be talking about in tonight's lecture. We're going to be giving the chordates or the vertebrates some general characteristics. We're going to go through their digestive system, nervous system, reproductive system, circulatory system, excretory system, uh, support and movement is talking about their skeletal system. We will talk about how they're classified, uh, some different body temperature, vocabulary, as well as some behavior. Now, something new that I'm doing in this particular, particular lecture, and I'll want you to listen to this all the way through, is scattered throughout, or maybe at the end, um, I'm not sure where I will put it, but there will be a... Um, a form that you will fill out. You'll just answer five questions, one of which is your name, but you'll click on the link and answer the questions or go to the link and answer the questions. Uh, this will be the way that I'll check for understanding with this particular le lecture in addition to your filled in the blank completed notes. So make sure that you listen to this all the way through so you can find the actual link and go and fill out that form. Okay. Again, this is an introductory lecture for Chapter 17. We'll be going over more in detail of the five different uh, classes of animals that are found in this particular phylum. But we're going to start with some just general characteristics. First of all, generally speaking, all of the organisms in this phylum will have a dorsal nodal cord. Um, notice here in the picture, the dorsal nodal cord is this red or pink kind of thing right here. This will eventually be replaced by the vertebrate. It also has a dorsal tubular nerve cord. This is the nerve cord here. Um, this will actually become part of the main nervous system. And then it has some pharyngeal pouches. These are folds of skin. Notice they're right here in green. Uh, they are folds of skin along the neck and they permit water to flow over the gills in aquatic animals and they actually become the neck and upper chest in land animals. Again, this is a, a general kind of um, beginning kind of phase of these chordate creatures. Okay, chordates will actually have three different subphylums. So we're in phylum chordata, but there are three different subphylums. Well, the first one is cephalochordata, and examples of organisms in this phylum actually look like this. They're kind of thin, kind of fish-like. They're all aquatic. They do keep their nodal cord their entire life. They never get a full-on vertebrae. Their nerdicord is their support system for their entire adult life. And those, those are, are called amphixiuses. Uh, the subphylum Eurocordata, they are actually from the sea squirt family. Examples are, are sea squirts or tunicates. But they have a nodal cord. They have all of those features, pharyngeal pouches and the dorsal nerve cord. Um, but they only have those nerve cords at the larval stage. They actually will lose all of those characteristics, and um, in their adult phase, they have the water coming in and the water coming out, pores, just like the sea squirts that we studied in the invertebrates. But they do have all of the necessary characteristics in their larval stage to be a vertebrate. Then finally, the subphylum vertebrata. These develop vertebral columns, usually before birth. Okay, the body temperature. There are two main body temperatures of organisms found in this phylum, endothermic and ectothermic. Endothermic, those are your warm-blooded creatures. They generate their own body heat. Um, they are active regardless of whatever the external temperature is. Um, examples will be birds and mammals um, and humans. Sometimes I wonder, though, uh, students in class, if their activity is dependent upon the temperature of the room. Uh, then ectothermic, those are your cold-blooded animals. They cannot generate their own body heat. They are sluggish when they are cold. They are active when they are warm. And some examples of these are amphibians, 
reptiles, and fish. All right, the skeletal system, or the support and movement of uh, chordates or vertebrates, they do have an endoskeleton. Some of the invertebrates that we studied uh, earlier had exoskeletons, but these vertebrates have endoskeletons, which covers their muscles, and it covers delicate organs. And there's two main parts. Even from our skeleton here, there is an axial which includes the vertebrate column, the skull, and the ribs. This area right here, all of this area right here is the axial. Then there is the appendicular, and the appendicular has an anterior end, which allows for appendages from the pectoral and the pelvis. So it has a posterior end. So we have appendicular here and axial all along the middle. The circulatory system, it is obviously a closed system that is comprised of a heart, and it has blood vessels, and the heart can have two, three, or four chambers. Now, this is not in your notes, but you'll want to write this off to the side because we're going to do an activity when we come back to class that deal with this, but two chambered heart organisms are examples such as fish. Fish have two chambers. Reptiles and amphibians will have three chambers. Reptiles and amphibians will have three chambers. And mammals and birds and crocodiles can have four chambers. And then there's three different types of blood vessels that I'm going to want you to know. Arteries, capillaries, and veins. Arteries are going to carry blood away from the heart to the tissues. So A artery, A OA, away from the heart. Capillaries are going to carry nutrients and pick up any waste. Veins will carry the blood from the tissues back to the heart. So arteries away from the heart, capillaries carry nutrients and waste, and veins carry blood from the tissues back to the heart. Now, a couple of other things that I wanted you to know about the circulatory and excretory systems. All, our, all of these organisms will have red blood because of hemoglobin and an oxygen-carrying pigment. Now, before you begin to get into a lengthy discussion about how your blood looks blue from your skin, we all have red blood. Your blood is not blue. It is not the blood that's carrying waste. All of your blood is red because of hemoglobin and oxygen-carrying pigment. The blue that you see is more due to the refraction of light. And most blood will pass through kidneys in all of these organisms where the waste is filtered out. Okay, the digestive system, we are dealing here with either carnivores or herbivores or omnivores. Carnivores, carnivores are animals that feed on other animals, like sharks and lions. Herbivores are animals that eat plants, like cows and horses. And omnivores are animals that eat both, plants and animals, pigs, bears, humans, and in this digestive system, the main parts are the esophagus, the stomach, and the intestines. Now, when we do body systems, we're going to go into far more detail about all of these different systems. So this is just a general overview for this phylum. Now, some accessory organs might include the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas. And again, we'll go over in detail what those do when we study body systems. The reproductive system. For all of these organisms, there are separate sexes. Male produces sperm from the testes, and females will produce eggs from ovaries. But you can have either external fertilization or internal fertilization. For external fertilization, the sperm is released onto the eggs after the female lays the... Oh, I have a typo. After the female lays the eggs... Now, this mainly happens in aquatic environments, and you might want to write that down also. Basically, both egg and sperm are released in water, and this is called spawning. This happens mainly with fish. Spawning is external fertilization. Internal, 
internal fertilization, eggs are fertilized inside the female's body. And these are mainly for your land-based animals. A few fish will do this as well, but these are mainly for land-based. Okay, now it's real important to talk about three vocabulary words dealing with how young are developed. There's oviparous, and those are animals that lay eggs before the embryos start developing. Now you have a place for examples there, and I'm just going to give those to you verbally. Examples here are fish and reptiles. Then there are viviparous animals. This is where the embryo develops inside the body of the female from which it gains nourishment. Viva Paris. And this, examples of this are mainly mammals, humans, um, and some fish. Now, ovo viva Paris, these are animals that develop within an egg, but that egg remains inside the mother's body up until they hatch or are just about to hatch. And examples of this are fish, sharks, lizards, and snakes. So your oviparous examples are fish and reptiles. Your viviparous examples are mammals, some fish. And ovoviviparous examples are fish, sharks, lizards, and snakes. Okay, the nervous system includes the brain, the spinal cord, cranial nerves, as well as spinal nerves, and then sensory organs. And within the system, there are five lobes. And the five lobes that I want you to know are olfactory, cerebrum, optic, cerebellum, and medusa oblongata. Now, as you know, the sensory organs include things like eyes, ears, and taste buds. And the, the, the functions of these five major lobes on the vertebrate brain are listed here. Olfactory is dealing with smell. The cerebrum controls voluntary muscle activity. The optic lobe controls the sight or receives impulses from the eyes. The cerebellum coordinates muscle activity and some involuntary activity. And then the medusa oblongata transports impulses to and from the spinal cord, including some reflexes. Okay, finally, we are to behavior. Behavior is the way an animal responds to its environment. And there are three types that I want you to know. Inborn, conditioned, and intelligence. Inborn behavior are innate. They get those from birth. There's no development necessary for those. Now, there's two parts of that. There are reflex behavior and instinct behavior. Reflex behavior is automatic. Involuntary response to a stimulus, something like blinking an eye when it's touched and recoiling from pain. Those are reflexes. Uh, the sucking reflex in young mammals is a critical reflex behavior. And then finally, instinct behavior. These are more elaborate. They're the result of a stimulus, such as nesting or flight or fight or flight. Uh, for example, an animal's instincts are highly specific. Birds raised in captivity that have never seen the mating ritual of their species can perform those rituals perfectly. After finding a mate, a bird also relies on instincts to build a suitable nest. Some instincts, such as self-preservation, like flight or fight, are found in almost all animals, meaning that they will flee from a large adversity. Okay, conditioned. A conditioned behavior is a learned behavior. This is a response learned by experience. Many vertebrates are capable of the second type of behavior. Um, they're going to learn this behavior through rewards, uh, similar to coming to training an animal to come to certain areas for feeding. Uh, this doesn't have to just come from man. After being sprayed by a skunk, most animals are going to learn to leave the black animal with white stripes alone. A dog that gulps down a toad and vomits it up 
releases strong toxins will probably never bother a toad again. Uh, some animals learn important behaviors by watching others of their species in a process known as modeling. Many of the infant care behaviors of chimpanzees are developed in this way. Okay, the last one is intelligence, and this is the ability to use knowledge to manipulate the environment or the ability to communicate. Such behavior is seen in some birds, mammals, and humans. Like some, chimpanzees have figured out how to use large stones to crack open a nut, while others fashion twigs to fish in termite mounds. The woodpecker finch, lacking the long probing tongue of the real woodpeckers, uses a pointy cactus spine held in its beak to dig grubs out of tree branches. All of these are intelligent, exam intelligent behavior examples. Okay, uh, that's all we have for the notes for tonight, but I do want you to go back to Edmodo, and there is a link asking five questions, and I want you to click on that and answer that and turn that in before you finish up tonight. And we will uh, have an activity in class where we're going to deal with these characteristics a bit more. Have a nice evening.